What I'd like to do in about 45 minutes to an hour is to give you a sense of what strategy is, what tools we use to develop strategy, and then teach you how to apply these corporate level tools to our day-to-day -day lives through developing strategic thinking abilities. So if you take this mini course, by the end of it, you'll very clearly learn what strategy is and its various levels, such as corporate strategy, uh, business strategy, and functional strategies. You will no longer confuse it with tasks or goals. Then you will also learn about uh, a strategy canvas uh, with value curves. It's a tool that will help you see the bigger picture, help you with positioning of your offerings, and hence develop strategies to become unique, right? And uh, while I'm teaching you these, I'll run so many case studies to make it crystal clear for you. So if you have seen my other videos in the past, you know that I'd love to give examples. I'd like to make it very, very grounded. Then finally, the second half of the video will be most useful part to you, I think, I believe. Because in reality, you're probably not the strategy manager or the CEO of a large multinational company, right? You're probably not Coca-Cola's chairman. So. What I did at the second half of the video is to customize strategy development so it can be applicable to your day-to-day -day lives. You know, you will learn how to develop a strategic thinking that will apply to your work, apply to your family life, your school, in simple terms, your life. You'll be a smarter person because you'll be more strategic in your thinking. You'll have more success because you'll have uh, the ability to identify more opportunities. You'll fail less because you'll be able to identify risks even before they become apparent. And I'll try my best to do the impossible and cover everything under one hour and make it super easy to understand at the same time. I'll try, but let's see if I'll succeed. So what is strategy, right? It's a word that gets used a lot and often in a wrong context. Uh, most people confuse it with goals. Essentially, strategy is a roadmap. Roadmap of how we are going to win. Where you are is your as-is state, and where you want to go is your to-be state. How you're going to bridge this gap is your strategy. So if I was to teach strategy to my children, right, I'd say, you want to reach the finish line first. You may walk straight to the finish line at five kilometers per hour, or you may extend your route, take more time as you have to travel more distance, but then on the way, collect the speed boost and, you know, shoot through the, the finish line at 25 kilometers per hour because of that speed boost. See, collecting that speed boost to win would be your strategy. Now, let's get back to the adults world. See, in business, we have three main layers of strategy. You know, the, the first layer is corporate strategy. Then we have business strategy, and then we have functional strategies. Let's start with corporate strategy. Corporate strategy is choosing what businesses to be in, and accordingly, how to allocate the resources among those businesses. For example, let's dumb things really, really down, and let's make it super easy first. I have $2 million. I wish I had $2 million, but let's say in this example, I have $2 million. Should I invest that money into real estate and go buy a few houses and a few properties and enjoy the rent? Or should I invest it all in stocks and enjoy the dividends? Or create a basket of multiple revenue sources? So in this example, let's say I decide to take my $2 million and go into real estate business. That's my corporate strategy. That's it. That's what corporate strategy is. Obviously, large companies with their big funds make bigger decisions, right? Um, should I invest further funds into my R&D, research and development, and create a new product in a new industry? Should I go into music distribution industry? Or should I go into satellite manufacturing industry? All, all, all of these are corporate strategy, um, corporate level questions. I don't know if I made a lot of sense there. So, um, now, I'm not covering here how to make that decision. I mean, should I go into real estate? It's just asking the question, right? To answer that, we need to use various strategy tools. I'll, I'll cover one of them in about probably 10 minutes. Um, but what I'm doing right now is just going over the definitions. And then uh, we'll also talk about so many examples and then I'm even going to run a case study for you. But before we get there, in simple terms, corporate strategy 
equals to what businesses to be in. That's it. Don't complicate it. Good. Let's move to business strategy. Now, business strategy is achieving a competitive advantage in the chosen industry. Now, what does that mean? Competitive advantage. For example, remember the $2 million we had? Million dollars we had? And that as a corporate level strategy, we decided to go into real estate, right? Now, my business strategy is to buy only townhouses in a specific location, like specific street, where I know it will appreciate in value more than probably other streets. Let's call it Mayfair, Mayfair Street. Or, um, yeah, I mean, to get that competitive advantage in this case, maybe it's because you know that in five years there will be a big shopping mall nearby which will change the face of the entire neighborhood. So that would be your business strategy. If you were managing a big corporate, then their decisions would be, for example, only manufacture electric cars, for example, right? So in this case, your corporate strategy is to go into auto industry, right? Car manufacturing. And then your business strategy is to invest in electric cars, right? Make sense? Cool. Let's move on. Let's move on. If I can speak. Now, the third one is functional strategies. And this is obviously all about functions, right? Like marketing, operations, finance. Now, let's go back to the $2 million example. I have $2 million. I decided to go into real estate as my corporate strategy. Then I decided to buy townhouses in Mayfair Street as a business strategy, right? Now, the functional strategies would be, for example, for operations, I decided to use a third-party uh, real estate company to collect the rent, to do the paperwork, to deal with tenants and do the maintenance work, everything in exchange for, let's say, 10% of the revenue, right? So that would be my operational strategy. Now, let's talk about finance strategy, for example, right? Because that's also one of the functional strategies among with marketing and brand management and whatever is applicable to you. So my strategy is to pay everything in cash instead of loaning from the bank. By that way, I run a relatively less riskier business and I don't have to pay 5% interest to the bank. Who wants to pay that, right? Nobody. And um, another functional strategy is acquisition strategy. And in our example, um, it may be to look for bank-owned properties through each bank's own website and then participate in those auctions. Now, that would be my acquisition strategy. So all of these are functional strategies and this list can go on quite a bit. Now, let me run a case study for you and it's going to be an actual one. Um, so before I concluded my um, management consultant career, uh, with PwC Consulting, PricewaterhouseCoopers, I was thinking of setting up my own shop, my own company. And obviously I was evaluating various options. And um, and one of the, so initially, yeah, I, I decided that I didn't want to continue being a management consultant uh, because of the lifestyle. I mean, at the age of 36, you know, constant travels and living in hotels isn't really something enjoyable. You want to prioritize your family and, um, you know, different things come into play. So because of that, when I put up my own company, I didn't want to continue in consulting. Um, also, various other reasons. I didn't think I could compete against giants like PwC, McKinsey and BCG. I didn't think I could win many projects, if any at all. Um, and even if I win a major project, I mean, how would I deliver it without a big team, right? And then it would be the same stress and the same travels again. So I decided that my corporate strategy can actually be in career management, right? I thought as someone who made it to the pretty much top of the corporate food chain uh, from extremely humble beginnings, um, I believed I had a lot to offer and share my path uh, for others who wanna have similar success in their careers. So this was my corporate strategy. Then my business strategy was to develop a training program teaching people how to get jobs with multinational companies you know, it's like an A to Z turnkey solution, right? And um, I teach not only how to get interviews with all these big firms, but also, you know, like all these strategies, but also teach them how to pass interviews as well through the bonus modules. Um, yeah, the program is called LIG. And my functional strategies were 
as follows. Let's start with marketing strategy. So my marketing objective was to first establish my authority and credibility and saying that, hey, I was a former management consultant and manager with PwC, come join my LIG program wouldn't work. So <laughs> people need to believe that you know what you're talking about, that you're credible. Then only they consider joining the program. You know, people need to see value in advance. So I wanted to do it through free content, free, but invaluable. So as a result, I chose YouTube, which allowed me to meet my two objectives. One, add tremendous amount of value to my viewers so I can establish the credibility. And two, have an opportunity to talk about my LIG program to those who are unemployed or underemployed. So this channel, the whole thing, all my videos is part of my marketing strategy. That's the only reason I have all these videos. Um, I don't have advertisements on my channel. By that way, I think everyone is happy. I hope, right? I mean, I'm not shoving ads on anyone's throats and I'm providing great value, but for those who really suffer from lack of progress in their careers, now they have the opportunity to do something about it. You know, it's a win-win. And as per my pricing strategy, which is another level of functional strategy, um, this was very interesting because I practically have no competition. Even if I do, I don't know about them and I don't have to know about them. It's almost like irrelevant. So I wanted to have a price point as low as possible without people considering it a low quality product, right? So I wanted everyone to benefit from it. Um, but not so cheap that not so not so low in price so people think it's cheap and low quality now yeah i guess these are enough examples no so i hope i was able to clearly explain what corporate strategy is what business strategy is and what functional strategy is and their various different strategies now let's talk about tools yeah tools are the fun parts uh strategy development tools let's get to it the purpose of tools is to help us make decisions right and find competitive advantages for example you're working on uh, your corporate level strategy and you're thinking of a few industries that I can go into right which one is the correct one so what do you do this is what you do you take out your strategy toolbox right and choose a few tools you know, you choose a few for analyzing the external environment, right? Uh, then you choose a few for analyzing the internal environment, right? These are all tools, you know, you take them out and you put them to work. As simple as that. For example, you can do Porter's five forces and industry value curves for analyzing the external environment. And you can do maybe resources and capabilities along with McKinsey 7S to analyze the internal capabilities, right? Just the tools, take them out and then start putting them into work. We're going to do that soon. So um, just like in real life, right? I mean, you want to screw something on the wall, correct? I mean, you open your toolbox and you pick up a tool, you pick up a screwdriver, right? And you start doing it. You don't pick up voltmeter. It's the same with us. We have probably about um, 20 or 30 major tools and frameworks. And depending on your challenge, you pick various tools and then you implement them. That's it. Very simple stuff. The difficult part is, the difficult part of being a management consultant or a strategist isn't knowing the tools, it's the easy part. Learning them, I mean, it's just gonna take you maybe a few months, uh, probably less, easy stuff. The difficult part is to have a strategic thinking ability, but that's for the second half of the video. Now, a quick disclaimer, I'm not going to cover every single framework and tools available to us, all right? It would take a 20 hour video. I'm also not going to cover the most popular ones by MBAs like Porter's Five Forces and the Value Chains or uh, McKinsey 7S. And I'm not going to do that simply because they're not relevant to you. I mean, they're not, they're relevant to Warren Buffett and consultants to Warren Buffett. It's funny, really, like you search for strategy tools online or in MBA, you know, you're taught all of these tools like Porter's Concepts, you know, various other popular ones. And, and the funny thing is no strategist. Uh, or a management consultant can actually use any of these tools. They're just not practical. Um, okay, now, because it's YouTube, I just need to take one minute of your time to explain this a bit more. Otherwise, some MBA student is going to be pissed and say, what do you mean Porter's Five Force is not relevant? He's the greatest there is. 
Yes, he is. Uh, he really is. I actually met him multiple times. He's amazing. But let me explain. What are five forces, porous five forces? Five forces make you analyze five areas of developing a strategy, right? I mean, these are like um, the, the bargaining power of suppliers and then the threat of new entrants um, to the market, uh, threat of substitutes, bargaining power of, 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 of buyers and industry rivalry. In case you don't understand what he means by substitutes, um, it's basically a plane ride is a substitute to bus ride, right? They both serve in the same purpose, but their unique selling points are different. So back to the point about five forces. Do you know how much it costs to actually get analysis on each of these five blocks? I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars here to properly gather data and run analysis. It's a major work. You need industry-wide data points. They're expensive. You know, you need, um, then you need surveys. You need uh, interviews with subject matter experts, hundreds. You need to purchase data, run analysis, run confidence studies, you know, test so many hypotheses. Uh, it's a major work. It's a very expensive work. So in reality, what happens is that you know them, you're aware of the five forces, you know, it's nice and all, but you never use it to make decisions. It's just one of those inputs you're aware of, but not necessarily in a deliverable form. Okay. I mean, seriously, which client is going to pay you uh, $5 million just to get an idea on five forces? Not many. Yeah. Maybe only very large corporates. So in case you got excited and started writing a comment, there it is. That's my view. Now let's move on. This tool, this tool that I'm going to share with you, uh, that I'm going to teach you, um, helps us see the overall picture and create positioning strategies. It's called value curves, or some also call it um, strategy, strategy canvas or four actions framework. We call it, I call it value curves and it's awesome. You'll love it. And I'll talk about it in great details. Um, I'll also run a case study for you, multiple case studies so you can see how it works in real life. All right. So here's our strategy canvas. Let me take it out. You probably see it on your screen as well. Right? So the X axis is the offering level. And Y axis is the key competing factors, right? So key competing factors obviously varies from industry to industry, right? But in our case, um, I'm now taking hospitality industry, hotels as an example. And what would be the key competing factors for hotels? This is your step one, right here. So in general, we would have what architecture, we would have lounge appeal, room size, technology access, right? Like internet, Wi-Fi. We would have room amenities, silence, bed quality, and price, right? Now, the next thing we need to do is to attach the value curves to this canvas. It's about to get more exciting. So now you can do it on an industry level or at a particular competitor level. Now let's do it with industry in this example. Okay, so after having spoken with, with industry experts and having conducted surveys and, you know, let's say we're able to draw the industry value curves. Now we know how the industry stands, our comp or our competitors stand in terms of each competing factor. Okay. Now your step three is that you need to know your is is state and translate it into a value curve as is means your present situation. Basically, how do you perform in those key competing factors, right? This is where customer service play a key role. You need to run customer surveys and find out where in that canvas your value curves are. Let's say you're like this, right? So far, so good. Now you know the industry value curves. Now you also know where you stand like this. So this lets us see the overall picture and help us identify, you know, the trade-offs. It's a beautiful canvas, very, very helpful, you know. But here is where things get very interesting. Having a high score, for example, here with silence, right, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that's what we want or need. Life is all about trade-offs, right? Let's talk about this. Now, step four, step four is to apply our four actions framework to this canvas and four actions framework is uh, 
very simple terms. It tells us which of these competing factors we want to eliminate, reduce, raise, or create new ones if you want to. Now let's, let's, let's reorganize this canvas and let's look at the trade-offs and take maximum benefit from them. Okay, let's say I own a hotel and um, where my frequent visitors are backpackers, okay? Then I'd have to draw a value curve to suit their primary needs and save funds from those areas where they don't care about. Make sense? For example, I need to eliminate luxury architecture and lounge appeal, right? Reduce the price and the room size if I need to. But I need to raise the quality of the bed, hygiene and silence. They're backpackers, they walk all day long, so at the end of the day, all they want is to go take a nice shower, you know, check their emails and have a good night's sleep so they can continue the next day, right? So with the money, I save from not having a luxury exterior, architecture, or luxury lounge, I can invest in high quality beds and high speed internet. Makes sense, right? Now let's say I own a hotel in a business center, then my value curves will change again. So they will need to reflect the new conditions. I need to eliminate or reduce the leisure activities such as not all of them, but like the outdoor pool, for example, or if I have water park, they don't need it, you know? Um, but I have to raise the lounge appeal, the room amenities, access to technology, and as a result, the price. Then I need to create a bar or a luxury restaurant. This is how you create a competitive advantage. And it applies to all industries without an exception. It's a canvas that makes you see the bigger picture and helps you identify areas of strategic advantage. Let's say you have a direct competitor. Hmm? Uh, direct competitor hotel just next to you in the same street. Now, your value curves compete. Hmm? It's like a game at this stage. You're both competing for the same target audience, but one of you will need to create a competitive advantage. Let's say it's one of those areas where people don't make reservations in advance. You know, they just show up. So obviously, you will need to put more emphasis on your architecture, right? And your lounge appeal. I'll share with you something interesting. Remember this, to win, you don't have to win in each competing factor. You can't just be, you can just be good in all of these, but have a landslide win in only one of these factors and that may just be enough to become a market leader, right? Let me give you more examples from different industries. Let's take automotive. What is the best car company in the world? Who is the best car in the world? Can you answer this question? You can't, right? You can't answer that question. Without saying, it depends, right? It depends on what? It depends on the segment. Are you talking about the performance, the luxury, reliability, safety? What are you talking about? Exactly. That's what segment segmentation is all about. That's what corporate strategy and competitive um, edge is all about. You're competing, but you're competing to be unique. You don't want to ever compete on the cost. It's a zero sum game. You want to be competing to have a unique offering in your particular segment. You want to be the best at that particular offering and just be good in others. Now, um, let me give you an example. Let's take this. Which car company this white line is? It has okay or medium luxury, right? It has okay reliability, but very good in price and performance. Can you think of its name? It's Subaru, right? Relatively a low cost, but a high performance car. How about this? Uh, let me give you another example. I'll put it over here. So let's say it's high luxury, right? Uh, high reliability, high price, but low performance. Rolls Royce. Right? Another one. Let's say medium luxury, medium reliability, very, very high performance, crazy performance, and a very high price. Ferrari. Right? Another one. High luxury, medium reliability, high performance, and high price. 
Aston Martin. So you see where I'm getting at? Although at first glance, it looks like they're all car companies competing against each other. They're only competing to be unique. Now, Lamborghini was um, for a while ago, now, Lamborghini is competing against Ferrari and it was not doing very good, right? It was on the verge of bankruptcy and Volkswagen bought it. So again, now they're trying to be unique and create different segment for themselves, but it's not working so well um, so far. So the key takeaway is you don't have to be the best in everything you do to win. You just have to be unique in your own little segment and that'll probably be enough. Now this concludes the first half of strategy development. The exciting part is about to start. We're now going to talk about a lot more important aspects, right? It's the, it's the, uh, I can't speak. <laughs> I got so excited. It's the, it's the strategic thinking, right? It's really what counts the most. I suggest you take a break now. And I suggest I also take a break. Um, let's get some fresh air and come back when you're ready. Because you really, really don't want to miss this second part. It's, it's going to be life changing for you. We talked a lot about the strategy, what it is, what it's not, and one of the tools available to us, right? So they're all nice and sweet, but you're probably not managing a large corporate or a company. You know, you may just want to know how to develop strategies for your own career, how to get jobs, how to get that promotion, right? How to win that race if you're a sportsman and that you need a certain level of thinking that will open all the doors. Now, what I will share with you over the next maybe 20, 30, 40 minutes will absolutely accelerate your progress. It won't be a magic formula. Magic doesn't exist, but it will help a lot. So to make the best uh, use of these tools in our careers, we need to develop a new level of thinking. And this new level of thinking, which you'll learn soon, requires immense amount of mental horsepower. Not even horsepower, I'm talking about just pure mental torque. And you need that mental torque, the mental power to be active all the time. I'll also teach you how, but step by step. Have you ever taken an IQ test with Mensa or any similar organization? Or even an online IQ test, doesn't matter. You probably have at some point in your life, right? See, your IQ score is you know, from those tests is similar to your car's maximum horsepower score. You know, like the most car engines, the, ga the, the gasoline or diesel ones, they generate their maximum power at really, really high RPMs, you know, RPM meaning revolutions per minute. So in simple terms, you get maximum power from your car's engine when your car's engine is screaming, right? And vibrating, the whole car is vibrating. And that's not how you drive your car in your day-to-day -day life, right? You don't go to shopping or to your office in the morning with making your engine scream just so you can have power available to you all the time. You don't, right? And if you do it that way, then one, it'll be very uncomfortable and two, you'll run out of gas very quickly. And so what you do is you just gear up, put the transmission on the next gear, right? So what you do is you sacrifice power for comfort and economy. Now, continuing with the same analogy, your brain works very similarly. You only get peak powers when you absolutely need it. Other than those times that you need it, your brain just gears up and sacrifices power over comfort and economy. In this case, economy represents saving glucose or alternatively ketones. So. Just like how you save gas in your car by not driving at extremely high RPMs all the time, you save glucose and sometimes ketones in your brain by not pushing it so hard. So far so good? Great. Whew. Okay, now, if you enter some sort of a test, right? then your focus gets activated. You command your subconscious to fully engage in the activity at hand and use your maximum IQ. But once the test is over, you go back to only using 10 to 20% of your mental capacity and spend the rest of your day like that. You're, you're not even aware of this. It, it, it just happens automatically. 
Now listen to this carefully. To be an insanely successful person in everything you do, you need to use your brain at near maximum capacity all the time. Not once in a while at high RPMs like I gave in the example, no. You need a brain that outputs its maximum power all the time, not just once a day for five minutes or once a week for 20 minutes or once a month for one hour. Now, I'm gonna teach you how, but I wanna go in a logical sequence. Now, in the past, there was a good reason for your brain to evolve to work this way. Your brain consumes the highest energy, highest calories in your body. It weighs about 1.4 kilos, right? Kilograms, and you know, it's what equals to about 2% of your total body weight, probably. But here, where it's interesting, it demands 20% of your resting metabolic rate. That's huge. That's a huge amount of energy consumption. And that's just to keep things in order, right? So in the past, like millions of years ago, like from 3.2 million years ago, from the time of infamous Lucy, um, from that time until only about 10,000 years ago, which is when we transitioned from hunter-gatherers to farming, the food supply was limited all these millions of years, right? And as a result, your brain learned to adapt and cut down on energy usage until it was absolutely needed. So now, when you push the brain a bit too much, unless you're trained and, and, and used it, uh, it gives you temporary mental exhaustion or mental fatigue. You leave an important exam or test and you feel this, right? The mental exhaustion, you know, like after meetings, you feel that sometimes. It's, it's the evolution speaking. It's telling you, hey, you're using it a bit too much. You know, I don't like it. Take it easy. Uh, it's just not used to it. it. It doesn't like it, you know. It didn't evolve to work that way. But we live in different times now, don't we? I mean, we have no shortage of food supply. Not anymore. We can, we can buy calories now. Therefore, we need to push and train our brains to start using 100% of its capacity all the time. What is limiting me? It's not glucose or ketones. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this so you understand that you already have the same hardware used by Einstein and Isaac Newton. You're as genius as they are. You're just limited by the software, not the hardware. You all have the same hardware. But I'm gonna talk about the how part very soon. Um, but before I do it, I want to give a few more examples, okay? We're like, you know, a moth, you know, I'll put the thing. We're like a moth. A moth guides itself by light sources. And in the past, the only light sources at night were the moon, uh, the planets and the stars. And their guidance strategy was that if you can keep those light sources at constant angle, right, you'd be able to go in a straight line. And because those light sources like stars are so far away, uh, you'd be able to go straight. But now things changed when small local sources of light came to being like candles or light bulbs, then the strategy of keeping light at a certain angle resulted in them circling around the candle and then possibly spiraling into their death. Uh, that's why you see so many insects like a moth and spiraling around your light bulb in your garden at night. That's the reason. That's how they are guiding themselves. So the evolutionary strategy they adopted that made them survive that are no longer making them survive. This um, not evolving and adapting fast enough is the reason so many species go ex extinct. You don't have to look far away for animals going extinct, you know, like leopards or Darwin's fox from Chile or, you know, etc. It's, it's happening all around you. None of us, including Homo sapiens, are fast enough to evolve. The only reason we survive and thrive and they go extinct is because as species, we're not faced with a challenge that is bigger than our capabilities to solve them. There isn't a smart, smarter being than us at the moment, right? And the only challenge we're up for is the one that comes from other Homo sapiens. That's why we never needed to challenge our mental capacity that much, because we already won hmm? with what we had. Why consume more calories? Why put more effort unless we really need to? We already won. Now, if you're wondering why I'm sharing this with you, uh, just be patient. I'm going to tie everything together beautifully. Uh, everything will make sense soon. So the point is your peak IQ means nothing 
in terms of hardware, you are as smart as Isaac Newton or Einstein or Nikola Tesla. You have the same hardware. The difference is in the software. They learned to adapt and exude incredible amount of brain power throughout their work, throughout their days. Think of Isaac Newton. Do you think he'd be able to develop Principia uh, if he only had 10 minutes IQ peaks a day or Einstein? I mean, he released like four major publications in 1905 that changed the future of humanity, right? I mean, he first, uh, his first publication uh, taught us how to measure the size of molecules in liquid. The second taught us how to determine their movement. And the, uh, the third publication was uh, like how light comes uh, in packets called um, photons. And the fourth one was obviously the special relativity. All in one year. Do you think he achieved everything in five minute peaks? The key takeaway is keep that light turned on at 80 watts throughout the day. And you never need 100 watts once a week. You'll be smarter than all the geniuses. Got it? Dennis, okay, fine. I get it. Yeah, how do you do it then? I'm sold, I get it. Evolution, we need to adapt. Keep the light on at 80 watts. How do you do it? Now, let's move on to the second part. Second part of the second part. You don't need a secret pill. You don't need surgery. You don't need anything that you don't already have. You already have the hardware for it. We talked about it. You just need to update the software a bit. You need to command it. Command it? Yeah, right, Dennis. I don't think it'll just listen to me. It will. It will. If you know the secret ingredient, right, the secret sauce, it will have to listen to you. It cannot reject you. And the secret ingredient is questions. What? Questions? Yep, questions. Currency to buy everything. Currency to buy my boat, my house, my car, my career. Whatever you desire in life is question marks. Currency to lead a very successful life is all question marks. That's all you need. That's all you need to get it started. Questions are commands you give to your brain for it to get to work and stop preserving energy. Critical thinking at its core is nothing but an ability to ask questions without even being aware of it, if I made sense at all there. It's, it's, the, state of, it's the state of mind that your brain is constantly looking for an opportunity to ask questions. And you had this ability before. You needed this ability before badly. Do you know when? Can you think of when? When you were a child growing up, your brain needed to work a lot harder than it does now as your environment constantly changed, right? Your body changed, your mental capacity grew, your height, your weight, so many unknown inputs. So it needed to stay active a lot more frequently than it is now. So, Okay, what do I do then? I'm not a kid anymore. Yes, you are not. Your first level of action is to put conscious effort to ask questions, like consciously, right? Just ask questions about so many things. Why did I do this report? Hmm? You don't have to voice it out. Just think of it. Why did I go there? How do I change my career? How do I need to get that promotion? Initially, these questions won't come up naturally. You have to look, you're gonna look funny to ask these questions. You're gonna feel funny, but after a week or a month, you'll notice something very strange. You'll notice that your brain now continues to uh, continues the effort without you consciously asking. You know what I mean? It, it, it starts asking questions subconsciously now. You won't need to sit down and ask questions anymore because your brain automated that activity. Those questions will start to pop out of nowhere. And that's how you win. It's questions. So you need to ask the right questions. But how do you know which questions are the right questions? How do you get to the right questions? By asking a lot of stupid questions, but within a scope. I know I'm a bit at a high level now, but just be patient because we'll get to the examples in a moment and how, how to ask questions and the whole thing. In life, you're almost always one smart question away from completely transforming your life for better. 
You're only one right question away from being super rich, wealthy, insanely peaceful and happy. Just one question. But you won't know what that question is until you start asking a whole bunch of nonsensical ones. Look at IKEA. You know, one of the companies that are truly mastered the art of strategy, right? The positioning, segmentation and value chains and value curves. Do you think IKEA's founder, Ingvar, sat down with management consultants like me and ran competitive strategy analysis, right? Not at all. No, he didn't have money to hire consultants at the time. He just asked a lot of questions and eventually he just got to the right question. So here's what's going to happen. You know, over time, as you repeat these steps, your brain automates this activity. It lets you do it without even thinking about it. Now, in your consciousness, you have space for about three things. You can do about three things at any given time. You can speak to a friend in person while texting to another friend while watching a movie at the same time. All of these things require conscious effort. But here's the interesting part. You can do almost infinite, infinite amount of things that your brain learned to automate earlier. Meaning while you're doing all those three conscious things, you can also ride a bicycle. You can also eat and walk and drink. The point is, as long as you don't need tools such as your hands, your, your body parts, you can run almost infinite amount of background tasks. The tasks that are automated, that's your goal. Ask so many questions all the time that your brain learns to automate the task of asking questions. And if you can get there, I'm sorry, when you get there, your brain will perform at very, very high power levels all the time. You'll perform similar to how Einstein did or how Isaac Newton did. Okay, Dennis, what does it have to do with strategic thinking? I'm confused. Everything, everything. Strategic thinking is creating your positioning in life, in, at, at work, at home. It's answers. Answers are the outcomes of questions. Questions are not natural to us. It requires uh, thinking. Thinking is uncomfortable. Using your brain is uncomfortable. We don't like thinking. Why don't we like it? Because it uses so much energy. What's wrong with it? Because that's how we evolved, right? So why do we evolve that way? Because the food supply was limited. Ah, got it now. So how do we break it? We break it by automating the question asking process because we can only do one of three things, right? The questions need to pop up in our minds without putting conscious effort. And in order to get there, we need to first consciously ask questions, teach the brain to automate it. This is the exact roadmap you need to follow. You'll know when that transition happens because you'll realize you're now getting so many um, questions popping up all of a sudden, right? Now, when that happens, you may choose to answer them or ignore them. But the important thing is having those questions coming to surface. So your brain did its job. It automated the question asking process. And the best part is it won't go away. You can still ride a bike even, even if you don't ride it for decades, right? Once it's automated, it's not going away. You'll get there. You'll see your, your brain will become a constant question asking machine. Now, why is that important? Here's an interesting thing for you. And listen to this carefully. Pre-internet, your, your ability to analyze your environment was limited by both your ability to ask questions and find answers. You couldn't get the answers uh, you needed to move on to the next question. So not only you couldn't ask questions, uh, but, uh, but also you, you couldn't find the answers. It was just a negative feedback loop, right? Now you can find the answers but still limited with questions. And what good is having an ability to find answers if you don't know the questions? That's what we're trying to solve, right? Now, I'll continue with some examples of how strategic thinking can apply to a career. But if you need to, I suggest you give another break, uh, get some fresh air and come back later when you're on top of your focus. Now, okay, let me give you some examples of strategic thinking at work. Not necessarily for top corporates, but 
uh, even mom and pop shops, right? Or for your own small department. Here's an interesting story for you. One day, uh, we were um, traveling around Southern Europe and we were in a very, very popular tourist destination in a very crowded street. It's, it's one of those areas where, you know, shop names were not even mentioned. Instead, their, sig their signboards uh, say things like Italian t-shirt, you know, and then cell phone brands, you know, Nokia, Blackberry or whatever. Uh, it was a, it was many years ago. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm sure you've been to those places. Anyway, we just needed a lighter. So we entered one of those shops at probably around 4 p.m. with an intention to buy a simple lighter. That's it, just a lighter. And we left that place at 5 p.m. with bags full of stuff we didn't need. We bought spices, we bought shoes and sandals and bags and pa backpacks and necklace and computer cables. And a lot of them were like either extremely low quality or fake as we came to understand in the evening. So the guy duped us. He mastered the art of human psychology. I was so mad at him, but I was also so impressed. You know, he, he almost hypnotized us. You know, he gave us subliminal suggestions and they worked. We were almost in a trance state and we didn't even buy a lighter. <laughs> uh, he was able to sell us all these fake and low quality goods. And now you may ask, how is this relevant to the topic? Well, the guy apparently asked a few very smart questions to himself, didn't he? Is branding important for my business? Right? No. Is customer retention important for me? No. You never see the same tourists twice. They come and go. Is quality important for me? No. Quality of the product will not be very obvious at the time of the purchase. It just needs to look good. Okay. Then what do I have to do? Screw the customer. That's it. As unethical as it is, he found a strategy that made him the most money by asking just a few questions. The guy didn't hire a management consultant like me, right? Just ask. Um, it's, it's similar like how IKEA's founder, we talked about this, Ingvar, also didn't, right? And uh, when you come to think of it, all these strategy tools we have, the poorest five forces, past blue ocean, value chains, value curves, they all serve one purpose. And that is the facilitation of question asking process, right? It, it, it keeps you within the scope. I mean, if you already have that natural ability to ask questions, you wouldn't even need any of these frameworks because these questions come out naturally. Right? And this isn't only applicable to profitability or the companies. Every single aspect of your life it is applicable to. Sports, school, career, getting your promotion, everything. It applies to everything. Let me give you another example. If you watched my previous videos, you know that I'm a champion seller. I mean, I don't make money from it. I'm, I'm a management consultant, but it's, it's, it's something I do since the age of six. Now, let's apply a similar level of thinking to sailing. Right? And what questions led me to become a very successful European cha champion sailor? So, to be the first, I need to cross the finish line first, right? Okay, now let's ask some questions. Question one, do I need to be the fastest in all points of sailing? I mean, do I need to be the fastest in each leg, like upwind and reach uh, or downwind, right? Not really. Okay. Which point of sailing then makes the biggest difference? Well, when we go upwind, you know, like with angles towards the wind, um, we cannot surf. So the maximum speed for all of us is limited by hydrodynamics. Let's say it's three knots for Optimist, which is what I raced when I was a kid. So, uh, but when, when we go reach or downwind, we can surf the waves. And that makes us reach greater speeds up to 15 knots. So if I can train hard enough to just be the best sailor in reach, and downwind, then I will make the biggest difference. This was a question I asked myself when I was seven years old, and I figured that it was going to be my strategy. And in all my 30 years of sailing, I just stuck by the strategy. We start the race in upwind, out of maybe 100 plus racers, I'm usually in top 10 or top 20, but never top five. But then we turn to reach, I make up to top five. And then when we go to downwind, I'm usually in top three or first. Now, this level of thinking, is exactly what corporate strategy teaches you, doesn't it? We talked about this before. You don't have to be the best in everything you do. Remember the example? What's the best car company in the world? Now, okay, you can say, you know, 
And then as I'm not managing a small business, uh, you know, nor am I a sailor or a sportsman. I'm just a mid-level employee. Fair enough. Let's cover more areas then. Let's say you are a, what can you be? Let's say you're a sales manager, right? Your upwind, maybe your B2B sales. Your reach is your repeat customers and your downwind is your joint venture partnerships, right? Now sit down and draw the importance of each of these legs and figure out which ones you need to be good and which ones you need to be the best, right? And that's how you get that promotion. You wanna have your MBA at Harvard Business School. Good, no problem. Your upwind leg is your GPA from your bachelor's degree. Your reach is your work experience and your downwind leg is your references, right? In simple terms, this applies to any industry, profession, any person. It's very similar to the value curves we did earlier, right? Isn't it? Let's take it to, let's take it to extremes. You're a girl, you wanna have a boyfriend, right? Okay. Your upwind is your looks. Your reach is your social uh, status. Your downwind leg is your character. Make sense? Now you don't have to have the, oh, well, we're gonna talk about limitations soon. So let's talk about trade-offs and limitations. One of the reasons I was never be the, uh, I was never the best in upwind was because I was very small compared to the others at that age. They were bigger than me. And in upwind we hike, so physically I wasn't as strong or as big as they were. And there was nothing I could do about it. Physically they matured faster than I did. It's a limitation. For example, in your case, you may never be the, you may never be the best looking girl or a guy in the world. Maybe you will, you will never look as pretty as Jennifer Connelly. And that's fine because if you can have a really good character and perhaps a strong social status, then that's good enough for you to have your dream partner. Make sense? Or in sales, um, maybe you are really, really bad at B2B sales, right? But if you can be great at JV partnerships, maybe that's all it takes for your employer to give you that promotion. In essence, that's what strategy is all about. You're competing, but you're competing to be unique. And the only way you can win is by finding the right answers. The only way you can find the answers is if you can ask the right questions. Making sense? The only way you can get those questions when you need them is if you train your brain to automate that activity so questions come to surface all the time without you using one of the three slots that are available. Okay, um, thanks for being with me for the past one hour. This video is done. Thanks for your time. And if you benefited from this video, please feel free to share in Twitter and LinkedIn. And if you share in LinkedIn, uh, please send me an invitation as well. I'd love to connect with you. Um, and finally, if you're not happy with your current career, if you're unemployed or underemployed, I strongly suggest you check out my LIG program. Just take a look and see if it is right for you. Uh, that's where I share with you some of the advanced and unknown strategies to land yourself interviews and jobs with multinational companies. Now, LIG is not a magic formula. Magic doesn't exist, uh, but it quadruples your chances and significantly shortens your job hunt process. And, um, oh, I also have an interesting promise. So if you take action and implement what you learn at LIG and still don't get results within 30 days, I will personally work with you to make sure you get to where you deserve. Now, that's, that's quite valuable. Um, very well. Once again, thank you and see you next month.